say to keep this more valuable. <laughs> Perfect. And can you see the chat functionality, Emily? Yes, I can. That's often an easier way for people to bring, bring things up. It can be hard to get a word in sometimes on a virtual call. Yeah, it's hard to know when to speak up. So yes, I will keep an eye on the chat now that I have both windows available. Perfect. <laughs> Yeah, that's the most painful thing about the setup is I feel like I'm constantly interrupting people unintentionally. <laughs> yeah, we did in one of my meetings this summer, we got very deliberate about the turn taking We had people raising hands. This is again, zoom functionality, but you could do the same thing with, you know, just put it in the chat and had the benefit that people who ordinarily wouldn't have been able to break into the conversation actually managed to get themselves into the queue. Mm -hmm. So that was Maybe for me to try. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'll well, keep an eye on the chat. Well, I, and I and I can bring them up if 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 they're being missed. But um, I think it's about time to get started. Uh, thank you everybody for joining. We're really excited to have Emily Bender here. I wanted to remind people that this is being recorded, and I'm going to turn it over to Swaba for just a brief introduction, and then back to Emily. Hi everyone, uh, it's my distinct pleasure today to invite Dr. Emily Bender to uh, the AI Tree Academy. Uh, Emily is a professor of linguistics at the University of Washington. She's also an adjunct professor of the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering at UW. Uh, she is faculty director of the Professional Masters in Computational Linguistics, the CLMS program, which AIQ has in the past hired from. Uh, Emily has also served as chair on the board of NACO and ICCL in past years. Uh, her research interests are very broad. Um, she uh, studies the interaction of linguistics and NLP. You should check out her uh, recent uh, award-winning paper from ECL titled uh, Climbing Towards NLP on Meaning, Form, and Understanding in the Age of Data. Uh, her other interests uh, include computational semantics, multilingual NLP, and societal impact of language technology, which today we will be hearing more about. Uh, she is the author of this very important book uh, for everybody in NLP, titled Linguistic Fundamentals for uh, Natural Language Processing. Um, she also teaches the ethics in NLP course, of which if you have uh, an UW affiliation, you should totally check out. And so without further ado, today um, I'll invite Emily to uh, tell us more about a topology of ethical risks in language technology with an eye towards where transparent documentation can help. Thank you so much, Swaba. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you everyone for your time and attention. Um, I'm happy to make this interactive. So if you have questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat and I will keep an eye on that. Um, before I dive into this, I just want to put in a plug for my other book. Um, the book you held up is volume one that does morphology and syntax. And last year I completed with Alice Lascarides a similar book about semantics and pragmatics. Um, and so I hope that uh, if people find the first one useful, they'll find the second one useful as well. Um, but that's not today's topic. Today's topic is ethical risks in language technology. Um, and my goals here are to present a typology of the risks of adverse impacts of um, language and voice technology. Um, and I'll say what typology means in a moment. Um, and I should add that this is um, a non-exhaustive preliminary typology. It's actually version, um, well, let's call it 0 0.2 because I did some revisions ahead of this talk. Um, I'll talk some about data statements, which is a positive step that we can take to actually position ourselves to mitigate those risks. Um, it's one tool, it's not a panacea, but it is useful, I think. Um, reflect a little bit on which types of risks data statements help with. Um, some, but not all, and then also describe some emerging best practices, both around um, data statements and then um, also, uh, and thanks for vouching for the book, um, around data statements and also just around mitigating risks and thinking about risks in general. Um, and I didn't have a good sense of how long this was going to take, so hopefully it will end up being a satisfying, coherent thing, even if we end up stopping partway through. That was my, my goal in ordering things. Um, so what do I mean by typology? This is a word that I've taken from linguistics, um, where in linguistic typology, we study how languages vary. Um, and it is more generally a systematic classification of phenomena along one or more dimensions. 
that helps to explore the space of possibilities and also helps to understand the relationships across categories. And basically my motivation here is I've been collecting examples of various things that have gone wrong or could go wrong. And it just sort of felt like a big pile. And I wanted to, to impose some order on that pile, um, partially with the goals of being able to understand to what extent it was systematic. Am I, am I missing things? Um, and so um, I went looking for taxonomies or classifications and what I found was not yet satisfying. Um, so Hovey and Spruitt in 2016 have a very important paper that brought these issues to the attention of the ACL community, um, so that ACL in Berlin. Um, and they survey some types of issues um, and they give us concepts like exclusion, overgeneralization, bias confirmation, topic overexposure, and dual use. And each of these are illustrated with NLP specific examples, but it's not exhaustive. It's just sort of here's a list of things that go wrong. And it's also not a typology. There's no sense of relationship between the categories. Um, another option. Um, is the work of um, Salam Barakas et al. in 2017, um, and also Kate Crawford, um, looking at allocational versus representational harms, and then under that there's quality of service, stereotyping, denigration, and underrepresentation. Um, this felt a little bit more satisfying because at least there was sort of this multi-layer taxonomy going on, but again, I didn't get a sense of how the categories related to each other. So, um, I looked to a couple of um, sets of like ways of thinking about things in order to come up with my categories. The first is um, value sensitive design, which is a um, school of thinking around design that comes from the work of Batya Friedman and her colleagues in the iSchool here at UW. Um, and among other things, value sensitive design tells us to identify the stakeholders, who are the people who are being affected and then work with the stakeholders to identify their values and then design technology to support stakeholders' values. And you know, through a few decades now of work, um, Batya and her colleagues have come up with various methodologies for doing these things. And the key concept that I'm gonna take here is stakeholder. And stakeholder is anybody who's affected by the technology, um, including people who directly use it and people who are not the users but are nonetheless affected. Um, the other body of work that I'm drawing on is sociolinguistics. Um, and I like to say that I'm sort of a closet part-time sociolinguist. My uh, just PhD work was actually on the interaction of syntax and sociolinguistics um, back at Stanford, um, where I got to study with Penny Eckert and John Rickford and others. Um, and from that, I learned some sort of key takeaways that are really important for NLP. So the first is that variation is the natural state of language. And that includes variation in pronunciation, in word choice, in grammatical structures, in prosody, in discourse structures at every level. Um, among the different varieties of language, there is usually one that gets granted the status of being the standard, but that's just a question of power and not anything inherent to that language variety itself. And what we then see is that when you get language varieties or features of language varieties that are associated with marginalized groups, those features and varieties become stigmatized, not because there's anything inherently wrong with the language variety, but because they are associated with people who have been marginalized. Um, furthermore, meaning, including social meaning, so what does it mean to use a certain feature, is negotiated in language use. Every time we speak, every time we listen, every time we write or read, we are reproducing and slightly changing the system. And then finally, our social world is largely constructed through linguistic behavior, both in terms of the categories we name and how we talk about them. Um, and so all of this means that technology that is working with language is working with really sensitive data just inherently. All right, pausing for questions, because that was a lot. Sociolinguistics is a whole field of study, as is value sensitive design. I know more about sociolinguistics. <laughs> All right, I'll keep going. Um, so here is my proposed stakeholder-centered typology. I basically say, let's look at this first in terms of trying to typologize, remember, the harms that can come about or the risks that can come about in using language technology. So I'm gonna think first in terms of who are the stakeholders that I'm considering. So direct stakeholders are the people who are directly touching the system and indirect stakeholders are the ones who aren't. And then among direct stakeholders, we can think about people who are using the technology by choice or not by choice. And then among indirect stakeholders, I've been categorizing the harms, and this is the new part, in terms of whether the harm is primarily to a community, basically spread across all individuals in that community, um, or harms to particular individuals. So that's my typology. Um, and I by now have too many examples to fit them into a talk of this length. So I'm just gonna give you a few of them to illustrate what I'm talking about here. 
Um, but I can say that for now, I feel like every example I know about fits into one of those four boxes, um, but I'm always curious for ones that don't. So here's an example of someone who is a direct stakeholder using a system by choice. Um, they are using a system that involves ASR in some way, be it a voice assistant or a dictation software, um, and it doesn't work for their language or their language variety. And what does that mean? Well, it gives them the suggestion that their language or language variety is inadequate, or it might make the product just flat out unusable for them. So that's sort of one kind of risk. And the other is the risk of a system not indicating how reliable it is. So if you imagine somebody who's relying on machine translation, say, or auto captioning for important information, they'll be left in the dark about what they might be missing if there's no information about reliability. Um, an example of not by choice um, is you've got someone who's subjected to a screening interview either conducted by a virtual agent or eavesdropped on by a virtual agent. Um, or someone trying to access account information via a virtual agent. Um, and those first two things exist. Um, this third one, as far as I know, does not exist. It's just my nightmare scenario, um, which is a situation where someone decides to put interaction with a virtual agent into the 911 access. In any of these scenarios, if the system's not working for the user's language or language variety, they could end up, for example, scoring poorly on the interview, even though their answers were good, because the online system um, didn't understand anything they said. And so it just gave them bad marks. Um, or they would be unable to access something, like their account information or 911. Um, like I said, 911 thing does not yet, to my knowledge, exist. And it really, hopefully, never will. But it's a danger that's out there. Um, another one uh, that's very apropos right now um, is the big language models, um, where um, GPT-3 and others can generate very real sounding text, in English at least. Um, but that text is not grounded in any relationship to actual facts. It's not connected to the world. There's no speaker behind the text who is committed to its truthfulness or who is considered the author of a piece of art, let's say. Um, a, a stakeholder then, a direct stakeholder, might come across that text and mistake it for statements made by some human who is publicly committing to them. Um, or they might become more distrustful of all texts they see online because they know that this exists. Um, and from a sort of sociolinguistic point of view, it's worth noting that language models that are trained on standard or official sounding documents will be able to sound standard or official. And with GPT-3, you can sort of poke it in that direction through that um, uh, the few shot learning paradigm, where if you give it the right kind of text, then it access that part of its training data, and it can come out sounding very standard and very official. OK, so all of that was direct stakeholders, where people are actually interacting directly with the system. You might say that the encountering synthetic text thing is sort of borderline, because they don't know that they're interacting with the system. Same thing is true, though, with the virtual agent eavesdropping on a job interview. right? Um, indirect stakeholders are people who are not the ones using the system, but are nonetheless affected. Um, and here, um, there's uh, I've divided this into community harm and individual harm. So Latanya Sweeney back in 2013 documented a really key um, scenario where this, and this wasn't made up, this was true, um, searching for, she actually was searching for her own name or saw someone searching for her name um, in order to turn up her publications. And then the sidebar on um, it was some Google served ads, uh, they got an advertisement suggesting that she had been arrested. Um, and so she looked into this deeply and found um, using uh, synthetic names, that nonetheless sounded black or sounded white um, and were not associated with arrest records anywhere, that the system was much more likely to suggest the uh, text for the ad that suggested a, an arrest um, history than the just give me more information about if the name was a black sounding name. Right? Um, this is a community harm because that's sort of perpetuating these stereotypes um, that are grounded in anti-blackness. Another example of community harm is we have these virtual assistants all around us now that by and large are gendered as female and then bossed around. And so we get this sort of um, everyday practice of bossing around female gendered entities that might bleed over into society. Um, another example is sentiment analysis systems that, for example, miss African-American language. And when you have policymakers trying to scan social media for sentiment, if it's not working in the variety used by a community, that community's input is going to be missed by the policymakers. I promised you that I wouldn't talk about all of these, so I'm going to skip a little bit. Um, but this one's really important. Um, 
with word embeddings, we are now using general web text as a proxy for word meaning, and in some cases as a proxy for world knowledge. But general web text reflects many types of bias, um, and that can turn up lots of kinds of harm, um, including what Sophia Noble documents in her book, Algorithms of Oppression, um, starting with the fact that auto-completion of search queries can repeat and reinforce harmful stereotypes. Um, switching now to individual harm, that same use of um, general web text as a proxy for word meaning um, can lead to lots of further problems like discrimination in resume review. Um, and also um, this interesting case that Robin Spear documented looking, um, she built a sentiment analysis system over Yelp reviews using word vectors from, this is pre BERT and whatnot, um, but same idea, right? It's so picking up general web text. And this system, um, systematically underpredicted the stars on the reviews of Mexican restaurants. And so she looks further into why, and it turns out, well, in, am in amongst the general web garbage is all of the toxic discourse in um, American news and also just commentary on the web around immigration through Mexico. And so the system had basically picked up that the word Mexican itself was a negative sentiment item. And so therefore in the sentiment analysis system, anything that was called a Mexican restaurant clearly was not getting a positive review. All right, um, then finally, this is the one that's most recently come across my desk. Um, there's very recent work by McGuffey and Newhouse um, at Middlebury, um, and they're in a center for um, studying terrorism and counterterrorism and extremism. And they basically went um, and poked at GPT-3 to see if they could get it to generate extremist texts. And guess what they could in the few shot learning paradigm? Um, and they talk about from their perspective as people working on counterterrorism, um, that the ability to very cheaply and easily make lots of texts like this could be useful for people trying to recruit extremists or recruit people to extremist causes because it could populate message boards that otherwise would be relatively empty with cheaply created synthetic text. Um, so there's a new thing to be afraid of. Um, uh, I guess I will just bring up the last one here. Um, Rachel Tapman, uh, in her work on speech recognition and other cases, warns against building classifiers for identity characteristics. So this is things like um, gender or ethnicity or race or age or um, sexuality and so on. Um, and one reason for this is that if you build an identity characteristic classifier, you are likely going to be misclassifying many people and that can cause harm. But you can also go the other direction and pick up on something and lead to outing people based on their use in public context where they thought that identity characteristic had not been part of their public persona. Um, so that's another kind of individual harm. All right, that's a lot. Um, just wanna come back to the higher level. Um, these are my four boxes. So we can think about direct stakeholders who are using the systems by choice or not by choice. And we can think about indirect stakeholders and harms either at a community level or at an individual level. Um, and um, I assert that all of the couple of dozen examples that I know about so far fit somewhere in this typology. Um, but I am always interested to find examples that don't. And I'm still sort of working with the boundary between harm to community and harm to individual because there's many things where it seems like it's actually both. Um, so that's a, um, to be developed. Questions at this point? I do have a question. Okay. So, uh, do uh, developers and researchers themselves uh, count based on your topology as direct stakeholders, people who are building the technology? Yes. Okay. Um, so yes, I've lost my windows. <laughs> Yes, so people who are building technology, the technology are kind of direct stakeholders. Um, and they are not ones that I have been currently worrying about um, in terms of uh, impacts on them. Um, but that is a, an interesting, I think, additional maybe box under direct stakeholders. Do you have examples that might fit in there? Uh, for example, the choice of, like in your example, to train on open web text or large language models, uh, that and uh, types of open web text, say, for example, Reddit, that is uh, a choice that is made uh, by the developers. Uh, I don't know what the impact on them would be, but um, that is also a way of like, 
biasing the system towards a particular uh, type of language. Um, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I don't have very good thoughts on this. Um, I think Can I in that. Sorry. Can I suggest an example for that? Um, sure. But like the recent data scientist that resigned from Facebook, mm -hmm. um, it seems I would say that she's had significant direct negative impact as a result of the system. It's not like directly from the system, but uh, like you... the, the decisions that she had to make in her daily job mm -hmm. um, related mm -hmm. to the system sound horrifying and would, you know, I would cause a lot of negative impact on me, I think, if I had to make that kind of decision on a daily basis. Yeah. And and one thing actually that's left out of this typology so far that I should find room for that maybe fits in this area is um, the, the annotators, people who actually manage the data labeling that things are trained on um, can, uh, yeah, exactly. So um, they may have to spend a lot of time looking at toxic language data. You also have the people who are um, involved in uh, handling the, the posts flagged as abusive on Facebook who just spend all day looking at really awful stuff. Um, so that's also um, a group of people to, to be concerned about and a kind of harm. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions? All right, I assume you're still just seeing my um, slides and not other random things on my desktop, I hope. Yeah, it looks good. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So. Uh, what does this mean for us as researchers and developers? Um, I think it means we have a responsibility to, um, to use the phrase, broaden our lens. Um, and that is to say, we need to think of our jobs as not just about framing and solving technical problems, but also about understanding how the tech we build, or in some cases choose not to build, fits into society. And that requires a slower pace of progress. And I put progress in scare quotes there, because I think a lot of what gets called progress right now, if we pull back and look in a broader picture, really wouldn't be valued as progress. Um, it, you know, it might top the leaderboards and it might get publications, but it's not in terms of big picture societal goals actually necessarily progress. Um, and it requires a slower pace of progress because we need the time to think about how what we're building fits into society and to go talk with people and learn, to go find the stakeholders and learn about their values. Um, and one sort of first step that is maybe a, the most, a, more comfortable or more accessible one than the next important one, which is also going and talking to people, is being systematic about documentation. And that's where the data statements come in. Um, next slide. But before I get to that, I just wanted, this is about sort of broadening the lens. So this is a cartoon of machine learning um, inspired by uh, Mitchell 2017. I mean, the idea is that, okay, if you've got the task definition and your learning approach and your training and test data and your evaluation metric, you've got the whole thing defined. And I want to encourage us to um, pull back and see the bigger context and ask questions like, why do we care about this task? Are we trying to build something useful? Or are we trying to learn about computers or about people or about the modeling domain? And with that in the background, we can then go on to ask, how does the data set model the task? How does the task relate to the world? How do we collect the data? And what happens when we deploy this? And these are all questions that need to be considered and answered before we can say the task is fully specified when we take this broader view of what our job is. Um, so transparent documentation. There was something in the air in 2018 um, when a bunch of us sort of looked at all these things that are going on and said, okay, well, at the very least, we need to know what's in the data sets. Um, so there's work that came out of AI Now Institute. Um, there's Gebro et al. 2018, which I think was Microsoft, though Tim is now at Google. Um, and that one is the data sheets for data sets. And Mitchell et al. 2019 um, at Google was model cards for model reporting. And Batya Friedman and I came out um, with data statements. Um, and I should say that the way data statements fits into this is the other projects were looking at machine learning very broadly. And we were looking at NLP specifically and saying, what's going on when the, when the data is language? Um, so. What's going, what, what are we doing with documentation? We're making it clear which populations and linguistic styles are represented and which are not. Um, and then that supports reasoning about the possible effects of mismatches. Um, and it also allows us to recognize limitations of training data and test data. So limitations on the training data affect how systems can be appropriately deployed. And limitations on the test data affect what we can measure and claim about system performance. So when we're claiming to have solved XYZ problem, in fact, we've only measured that as far as the test data generalize. Um, so 
very specifically, we have proposed a schema um, with these elements where we ask people to describe their curation rationale. So why were you choosing that data and how did you choose it? The language variety being described. Um, so like name the language, many times we don't even get that in NLP, um, but it's even not enough just to say English because English is actually many different language varieties. So we need that more specifically um, answered. Information about the speakers and the annotators in terms of their social addresses. Um, the speech situation being represented, other characteristics of the text, and then things like recording quality. And then this last one, um, provenance appendix, is many data sets are built on previous data sets. And so we want to make sure that we're pointing back to good documentation of all of them. Um, and did that. Um, so the idea was that you'd have a long form that documents this very thoroughly, and then a short form, which is you know on the order of 100 words, um, that summarizes the information and points to that long form and can basically travel through anything that's using the data set. So that you have in you know, your typical ACL paper, someone's using a data set. Well, what is that data set? You have the short form that you can put in there with a pointer to the longer one. Um, all right. Um, so where is this going to help? Um, imagine the cases that involve direct stakeholders whose language varieties are not well represented. Um, and the idea is that this documentation could help many different people in many different roles. So it would help us as uh, the researchers and developers to map out um, which underrepresented language varieties haven't actually been uh, documented yet or used in our data set construction, and then we could direct effort appropriately. And also it helps us to test our approaches more broadly, right? If we say, okay, I've got this idea about doing um, sentiment analysis or speech recognition, and I want to make sure that what I'm doing actually works across a lot of different languages and language varieties, let me go find the data sets that um, are going to have diverse representation, or maybe each data set itself isn't diverse, but I can test in many different contexts. Um, people who are procuring systems could say, okay, is this trained model likely to work for our clientele? Um, and this would be, you know, if you had the nightmare scenario of putting something in the 911 system, at the very least you could say, okay, what are the language varieties of people who are going to need to access 911 in this community? Does this model reflect that? Although still we just never, never ever should do that. Um, for consumers, we could say, okay, is this likely to work for me? Let me go read its documentation. Um, and then we also have roles as members of the public where we can advocate for models that are trained on data sets that are responsive to the community of users. Um, and likewise, policymakers um, could require automated systems be accessible to speakers of all of the language varieties in the community. Um, looking in, in the case of indirect stakeholders, um, first point is the same. Um, procurers could say, what information is this system going to expose and what's it going to miss? Um, so if I'm doing, for example, this public policy sentiment analysis stuff, um, am I actually likely to find all of the relevant data if I use this system based on what I know about the people whose sentiments I'm trying to find? Um, consumers can ask, is this software being transparent about how well it can work and under what circumstances it works better or worse? Um, and again, members of the public can advocate for transparency and policymakers um, can similarly require broad testing of systems and transparency requiring system confidence and also failure modes, what happens when it doesn't work. Um, so data statements are not going to solve everything. Um, mitigation of negative impacts of speech and language technology is going to require lots of work and lots of engagement and lots of cost benefit analysis. Um, but the idea is that data statements are one practice among others that position us in various roles to anticipate and mitigate some negative impacts. Um, some things where I think they don't help at all. Um, they aren't relevant to these issues of gendering virtual agents, for example, um, and it's not clear to me how they help with privacy concerns around classification of identity characteristics. Um, I think they can help with problems that stem from what's called automation bias, so this notion that, well, a computer said so, it must be objectively true, and if we can make it clear to the uh, members of the public, people deciding to buy these systems, people who are using them, that know what the computer is saying is basically pattern matching based on some specific data set. Here's the characteristics of the data set that will combat this notion of automation bias. All right, I want to pause there for a moment and see if there are any questions. Get back to the right window. Um. Sure, I, I, I guess I have a question. I, I share your concern about um, having an automated um, system to triage 911 calls. Mm -hmm. I can also imagine um, some problems with the wrong individual being in that position. 
as well. Maybe somebody's discriminatory or can't understand certain accents. I'm, I'm curious what key things you would highlight that makes you more concerned about a machine in this position. So I think part of it is that machines are inflexible. Yeah. Um, and uh, an individual who's going to discriminate, like that's um, surely something that's happening and something that we need to deal with. Like we know um, throughout the medical system that um, people who are perceived as female have um, are not believed as much in their reports of medical problems. And this is especially true for black women. Um, and so there are definitely sort of systematic biases out there in the world that need to be handled. Um, and so something like that could be going on in the 911 system. I think that in the case of a person not understanding well, they would at least be able to indicate that they're not understanding and work with the person on the other end of the line in a way that a computer couldn't. Um, or like, you know, if you look at sort of current, um, uh, systems anyway, I've seen very few things that are designed to have graceful fallbacks when they know they're not understanding, when they, you know, they have low confidence. Um, there may be scenarios where it makes sense to have um, something automated with a human in the loop, but then you have to also make sure that you are not giving sort of two-tiered access, so better, faster access to people who know how to speak the language variety that the machine can handle and slower to everybody else. Um, so it seems to me that it's, um, easier, though still a very hard problem, to um, work with humans to improve their performance around um, not being able to understand everybody else and around um, their biases than it is to be able to improve machines in this case. Yeah, that's a great an answer. Thank you. And I, I think a problem with human in the loop is it becomes a very boring job for the human. Uh, yeah. Depends on how the human in the loop setup works. So, I, I met with a machine, collaborating yeah. with a machine. But. Yeah. Um. Uh, may I ask the yeah. question? So, um, I was wondering whether you have any recommendations about how to refer to data statements when we are building models. For example, I use uh, GPT-2 to improve it in some way for some task. And I would like to emphasize that this uh, GPT-2 uh, has been trained on the web text. Uh, but it seems a little bit unusual to say that like in the introduction. So alternative is like say it in the appendix or maybe in a discussion section, but then that seems a little bit dismissive as well. So yeah, I was wondering whether you have any recommendations. Um, so my recommendation is to buck the sense of what's usual and go ahead and put it front and center, that this is actually really important information and that we have um, in, LP a, a, in NLP a culture of backgrounding it to the extreme. Um, and so this, this is where I'm out there telling people to name the language in the first place, even if it's English. And it feels awkward, right? Because we don't usually do it. Um, but it's really, really important because when we leave it out, we are um, sort of putting forward this false sense of generality in our work. Um, so I, I would say just you know, bite the bullet and, and own it as important information and put it front and center. Cool, yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, I had a question. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so do you think that uh, this uh, proposed problem formulation, like, or this formula, the formulation that you have, is this kind of isolated or is this like uh, uh, intermix with all other social sciences like uh, economics and politics? Like, or mm. um, so these are the kinds of problems that we definitely understand better by taking an interdisciplinary approach. Right, so that the when we're trying to understand how the systems we build fit into the society and the effects they're going to have, um, it is not the sort of problem that we can answer only with the tools of computer science, but needs to be done collaboratively um, with other fields. Um, and I would actually reach first for anthropology, sociology, um, uh, American ethnic studies, and the various names that that goes by, and so on. That, that these seem to be the fields. And um, there's also something called um, uh, science and technology studies that looks into a lot of this. So there, there are um, bodies of scholarship out there. And um, I think that you're right, it's not to be done in isolation, but to be done in collaboration and, and informed by those other bodies of scholarship. And I have a little bit of, I have a, my one of my last slides is some suggested readings. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. I'm going to pick up with a description of a workshop that we held in May. Um, it was nominally an LREC workshop, but it happened online instead, um, where the thought was we would like to 
promote this notion of using data statements, but we also want to make sure that what we've designed actually works um, across a broad range of research contexts. Um, and so we invited people from all around the world and we ended up with 38 participants representing every continent, so long as you don't think Australia is a continent. Um, where um, over three days, we uh, had a working meeting to develop data statements for the participants' data sets, and at the same time, elicit feedback on the data statement schema and distill best practices for data statement creation and use so that we can um, redesign data statements, if, if need be, to be more responsive to community needs, um, and also uh, make it easier for people to make more data statements. So this was incredibly rewarding. Um, also, I learned that being on the West Coast, one should just not schedule any big international meetings to start on a Monday, because that means a 7 a.m. Monday start. So word to the wise, if you're doing this, start on Tuesday, you'll be happier. Um, but otherwise, it was a great experience. Um, and um, I have some very preliminary results here. So um, my colleagues, uh, Angie McMillan Major and Batya Friedman and I are now going through the results of that workshop. We have recordings of the discussions and we have people's worksheets. Um, to extract best practices for writing data statements, um, revisions to the schema, and best practices for using data statements. Um, and one thing that came out that was kind of a surprise is we put in this interview methodology because we were trying to figure out how to handle interaction, how to make this online workshop in May be interactive. And so what we did was we paired our participants and had them interview each other to elicit the information to put into the data statement. And that was initially just a way to organize the workshop. But it turns out to have been extremely rewarding because people found that when you're deep in the construction of a data set, it's hard to keep an eye on what's not obvious about it, but you know, as with any research, right? And so by talking to somebody else who was not involved in the data set construction, it was much easier to figure out what needed to go into the data statement. So that's emerged as a best practice. Um, it is far easier to do this along the way of creating the data set than retrospectively. So collect the information while you go is a best practice. Um, and one key thing is that data statements don't have to be exhaustive. There are some things that we ask for in the schema that in some contexts are just not possible to know. Um, and people found it very helpful to know that it's OK not to answer everything, but still valuable to say, this information is not available, and here is why not. Um, and that basically means that somebody who's coming to it can say, OK, I can't use this because I need to know this information, or all right, in my use case, it's still safe even if I don't have that information. But to sort of make the lack of information visible um, is more important uh, is well, better to have it if you can. But if you can't have it, making the lack visible is important um, rather than just pretending it's not relevant. Um, and similarly, it's important to refrain from inferring information. If you don't have information about, for example, if you've scraped a social media data set, don't try to do identity characteristic classification and say something about the genders represented, right? Because you don't actually have that information directly. So just say it's not available and say, why not? Um, and then another thing that came out of this is we were thinking of data statements as sort of an additional set of documentation that goes beyond what travels with data sets already. So you, know, you would already see the annotation schema described usually, um, and license information, anything to do with copyright of text, for example. Um, and what people in the workshop wanted was to be able to at least see pointers to that in the data statement, because they started looking like, here's the front door into your data set. This is the, the main description of what's going on, and so it needs to connect out to these other uh, bits of documentation. In terms of using them, um, there's sort of the uh, initial ideas that we had held up. So um, somebody who's coming to use a data statement could then scrutinize it, say, OK, is this going to be appropriate in my use case? Um, and also to more clearly scope the generalizability of the results. Um, but something that came out of the workshop that was not in our initial ideas was that it can be really useful to do this before starting data set creation to help guide data collection, to sort of realize, OK, actually, I want to make sure that I'm getting a representative sample of this population. So let's make sure that I'm actually getting participants from different age groups. Or um, you know, I would like to be able to talk about demographics, even though I'm doing a social media thing. So maybe I can get people to opt in to my Twitter data set rather than just scraping and so on. Um, and then finally, a use case that didn't um, occur to us ahead of time is that these data statements can help communicate to allied fields what we're doing in NLP. If you have a careful description of what's in the data set, that can be a valuable way for somebody, for example, in the legal domain to understand NLP technology. Um, all right, so what else can we do? Um, I think it's important to make time, as I said before, to slow down and to consider early and often questions like these. So what are the use cases of this thing that I'm, being, that I'm busy developing? Um, 
how does this specific machine learning task that is inputs and outputs relate to the intended use case? What are the failure modes and who might be harmed? And what kinds of bias are likely to be included in the training data? Um, and I think that one way of seeing this in general is to broaden our notion of scaling up. Oftentimes, we think of scaling up as just more data, more documents, more users at the same time. But I'd like you to think about how it's not just about large numbers, but also about diverse communities and diverse experiences with the software. So scaling up means not more people like the people we're already familiar with, but more different interactions with the software and thinking about how to support those and how to make sure that they're all beneficial. Um, all right, I'm gonna pause for questions again before diving into a case study. Let me get back to the thing where I can see your questions. Yeah, I, I have a question actually. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've written a few, a few model, model cards mm -hmm. and I was wondering, um, I, I know they're slightly, slightly different from, from the data set kind of cards, but I f frequently ran into a problems where I wanted to provide, I, I was ending up providing general advice on using machine learning models, which were, weren't really specific to a particular model. So for instance, things like this model should be um, used to augment some particular experience rather than replacing, uh, for instance, like a customer service agent or something. Hmm. Um, and I was wondering if you had any advice on um, like where to draw the line between describing a particular model or data set and generally prescribing how you want it to be used. And, and, and at what point that, that becomes too general? Yeah, does that make sense? it does. Um, I don't know, um, because data statements are about data sets and not about models directly, we don't yeah. have a section about like how this should and shouldn't be used. Um, but just to pick up the example that you gave there, um, it might make sense to say, if you can bring up specific examples that connect to the model in question, then it's worth putting it in. So if you say this, you know, this should be used in collaboration with a human in this way, um, rather than replacing a human, because if you replace a human, this thing could happen. That would make it relevant, I would guess. Uh, I see, okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Other questions? Um, as, as a follow-up to that, perhaps it also makes sense to have uh, task statements. Um, so you have like a broad level task statement and then there's the uh, data statement um, and then you get to the specifics of the model card. Um, and then the model card could pull in information from the data statement as well as the task statement. Um, yeah. And that would help in addressing some of those general things as well as the specific things that are related to a specific model. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point. I guess the things that I'm talking about probably are related to tasks more than they are to the models themselves, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. All right, um, so uh, I wanna bring up an instructive case study um, that was in this year's Germaval shared task, um, where um, it just, it looks like they basically said, look, we have a data set that's got, um, that we can divide up into two. So let's make one of these the input and one of them the output and see if we can do this with machine learning. Um, and in particular, what they had was a bunch of um, admissions information from this um, university in Germany that asked students on applying to take um, IQ tests and then something called an operant motive test. Um, and so they had their scores on those tests, their answers in this operant motive test, their high school grades, and maybe a little bit other information. Um, and they turned this into an NLP shared task. Um, which, I mean, yikes. So, um, you know, what could possibly go wrong if you're trying to predict IQ from short snippets of text, or you might say what could possibly go right. Um, and so this uh, occasioned quite a bit of discussion on the corporate mailing list and also on Twitter, um, because uh, those who look into um, the history of IQ tests um, and how they are constructed and deployed um, in the US context, we see quite a bit of racial bias. Um, and there's you know, not necessarily any reason to believe that it's better elsewhere. Um, and so I, in the context of this, I came up with some questions that I think should have been asked, um, if not by the shared task organizers, then by the conference organizers who were accepting the shared task proposal. Um, 
So one thing would be, does the output of the ML task match the information it's framed as predicting? Um, so when I say framed as predicting, um, this was, we're predicting intellectual ability. Well, intellectual ability and IQ scores are not the same thing. So there's your first mismatch. That's a, a task world mismatch. Um, does the output of the ML task actually contain enough information? Sorry, does the input contain enough information to predict the output? Well, no. Like, why would you ever think that a few short sentences that are answers on this operant modus test, which will involve describing pictures, would be accurate information to predict IQ, right? Just because you have it in the data set doesn't mean there's enough information in the one to predict the other. Um, and if it looks like there is, then you know we know by now that these um, you know deep learning models, for example, are really good at picking up on artifacts. So yeah, chances are the bias in the IQ test is going to correlate with something going on sociolinguistically, and the system will be able to pick that up. But that doesn't mean it's predicting intellectual ability. Um, then you can ask, what are the intended use cases for this technology? If it's working as intended, who might be harmed and how? And if it's not working as intended, who might be harmed and how? Um, and you know, all of this takes time. And sometimes the answer at the end of that is, this is not a good idea. Even though we've put some effort into this, we're not going to pursue this research direction further. Um, so asking the questions is a good first start. How do you answer reliably? In many cases, that involves you know, looking out beyond computer science, um, both to other fields and then also um, to people who are not in the academy, but are um, people who have the lived experience and especially people who have turned that lived experience into um, activism or various other kinds of organizations to go find out, okay, what does it mean? What, does, what do people getting labeled with IQ scores mean actually out in the world? There's people who are working on that, both from the perspective of academic studies and from the perspective of um, addressing the harms that it's causing. So that's lots of places that we can go look for information. One other case study um, is GPT-3 um, and this McGuffey and Newhouse study that I referred to earlier. So I want to ask, if something is too big to document, does that mean it's too big to deploy? And I'm asking this as a genuine question, even though I realize that if like, I put that out as a tweet, it would look like a statement and not a question. Um, so these ginormous language models pose a dilemma in that if their success rests on gathering data sets too large, nice typo, Emily, to feasibly thoroughly document, um, how could they be used safely? Um, and uh, there's this new paper, like I said, showing that GPT-3 can be led through few shot learning to produce text in the persona of a conspiracy theorist. Um, so here um, is a screen cap of that. Um, and so the bold is what they input into the system and the non-bold is GPT-3's output. Um, and the key thing here is that GPT-3 is talking in the persona of the conspiracy theorists, like in the first two answers that were provided in, in, the, in the training, the mini training segment there. Um, not saying people think that QAnon, QAnon is blah, 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 just QAnon is. Um, so the questions that I have about this are, could GPT-3 have produced this without having similar conspiracy theory texts in its training data? Um, I don't think so. Um, but I'm curious as to theories as to how it may have been able to. Um, if it needs to be in the training data, how much is required? And actually the worst case here is that only a little because it's much harder to design data collection and data cleaning processes that remove every last trace of this, right? You can certainly imagine that you're going for only reputable sources, but those reputable sources are going to be discussing conspiracy theorists and showing snippets of the message boards that you carefully avoided uh, incorporating into your training data. So I think it's really worth finding out, is this something that requires a lot of training data to cause, or is the setup of GPT-3 such that it can actually produce this off of just little snippets in its training data? Um, there's some trade-offs though. So we are definitely seeing benefits from very large language models for things like improvements in speech recognition um, that definitely serve the social good. If you think about auto captioning um, for people who, um, need it for better access to lots of online video and audio content. Um, so uh, how do we get those benefits um, while mitigating the risks? And um, one question to ask is, okay, well, how do we know that very large language models are the only way to get those benefits? We certainly do get those benefits with the very large language models, but maybe there's actually other kinds of things we could be researching that are looking from you know better, um, exploiting smaller data sets that are small enough that we can thoroughly document them. Um, and then conversely, we can say, okay, we're going to use these big language models, but let's think about ways to prevent or reduce the dispersal of synthetic text, for example, some kind of watermarking in the synthetic text so that it could be automatically detected later on. Um, 
So I promised you a suggested reading list. Um, there is, back in 2016, when I started organizing my first class on this, there was very little that was specific, especially to ethics and NLP. Now there's a lot. Um, it's to the point where it's a little bit hard to figure out where to start, which is why I wanted to put this um, list together for you. Um, so Sulin Blodgett had a wonderful paper with colleagues at a ACL um, that's a survey of 146 other pairs, papers looking at bias in NLP. And so that's a great way into that subliterature. Um, in terms of thinking about gender specifically, I like this paper by Larson from the EACL workshop on ethics in NLP in 2017. Um, I think Latanya Sweeney's article from 2013 is another good starting point just to think about a specific issue and how to frame investigating these. Um, I promised uh, pointers into other fields too. So these books um, by Sophia Noble and Ruha Benjamin are very valuable um, and come from the perspective more of sociology, anthropology, African-American studies, um, and I think are a good way to get a sense of how to think about technology in a broader context. Um, and then there's also a, a very nice blog post about the digital phrenology that keeps popping up um, by Aguera Yakas et al. Um, from 2017, um, which is another good sort of uh, look into how things that seem like perhaps innocuous, well, I'm just doing classification, I have inputs and outputs, and I'm interested in what the machine learning is doing, um, sort of backing up and looking at that in a broader context is a nice case study of that. So that's where um, I would suggest that you go next if you want to learn more. Um, and then just to summarize, um, the L in NLP means language, and language means people, and by the way, also variation. Um, when we're working on tech that will be deployed in the world, we need to keep an eye on how it fits into the world. Um, and I meant to say this earlier, but I'll say it now, it's really easy to get bogged down looking at all of these different examples of things that go wrong and the sort of, this is too terrible or this is too hard, and then turn away either from NLP in general or from its societal impacts, but we don't have to get stuck there. Um, and part of the idea with data statements and model cards and data sheets um, is that transparency is a good starting point. It's something concrete that we can do um, and documenting data sets and models and getting a clear discussion of the application world relationship will sort of naturally bring us into that broader conversation. And that's all the slides. Um, I have, by the way, I have citations for everything. So if someone wants this slide deck, I can send it to you. Just, it's all there. Um, but we have, I think, a few more minutes for questions. First, let's give Emily a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Um, uh, I have a question. Uh, hi, Emily. Thanks for the talk. I thought it was very educational. Um, so I come from more of a biomedical background and in biomedicine, uh, there's like a history of institutional review boards and kind of policy level changes to address um, harms mm -hmm. done to humans, human subjects. Mm -hmm. And certainly like when we talk about NLP, it doesn't seem like we're experimenting on humans directly, but there, in some sense we kind of are because the deploy models absolutely affect uh, individuals and society as you mentioned. So I, I was wondering whether you could comment on um, sort of like, uh, like voluntary changes that we can make um, in some sense the kind of data statements or the model statements that route versus um, maybe more of something like a policy change um, such as like the common rule or something like that. And kind of like at what point is like the tipping point over to like policy changes are necessary. Yeah. Um, I, I really think that, that it needs to be an all of the above kind of solution, that there's a lot of things that we can do as individuals to make our own research practice better, but in terms of um, direction of the field, then there's to be some policy changes. And I think the sort of one thing is for research that's happening at universities, um, there are institutional review boards for things outside of medicine, and it's, and it's definitely worthwhile for computer scientists working with data from humans to connect with their IRBs and say, does this apply? Like, what? It, Am I applying for exempt status? Do I need to do more? Um, and that can be anathema because it, it imposes a much slower and deliberate, more deliberate um, research methodology, right? To, in order to apply for IRB, you have to describe ahead of time what it is you're going to do. And that's not usually how computational stuff works, right? When, when we're, you know, we've got a data set, we just try something out, right? Um, and then we just, you know, keep iterating until we find something that works, then we write a paper about it. And so having... Um, the IRB in there is definitely going to change the sort of rhythm of things. Um, 
I think for the better, though I have to say, speaking as a linguist, it can be really frustrating to go talk to a university IRB that sees everything through the lens of medical intervention. And you know, when, when linguists work with human subjects, we aren't trying treatments on them. Um, and so there might be, you know, there's a process there, right? You can work with the IRB to get them to understand the kind of research. So that's one level of policy. Of course, um, you probably, you know, lots and lots of this research is happening outside of the academy now. It's happening in research labs like yours that are um, not university affiliated. Um, there are some policy changes happening in our professional societies. So the ACL has adopted the ACM code of ethics. Um, and the first um, real effect of that was that EMNLP actually had ethics review of some of the papers. Anything that was flagged as needing it got actually reviewed um, from an ethical perspective. And so I think we're gonna start seeing more of that. Um, and then we also need um, policy and regulation at um, a sort of law governmental level. Um, and here I'd like to point to the work of Ryan Kahlo and his colleagues in the Tech Policy Lab at UW. I think they do really interesting work there. So all the above. <laughs> Other questions? Um, I see that Daniel has asked for the slide deck. Um, Shraba, if I send it to you, can you circulate it to everybody? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, I, I have a question, another question. Okay. Um, so um, a lot of what you talked about today is like super pertinent and relevant. Um, to uh, research that we interact with a lot. And one response um, I get when I uh, question about um, whether or not a certain technology should be built or certain data that should be collected, um, and it's understandable because like, we are in a very competitive environment, is that, oh, uh, so if we don't build it, someone else will. and uh, if we build it, we can build it the right way. Um, and another question I get that you have addressed, is, uh, this is a very hard task and the system is not quite there yet. So the kind of impact it will make is not going to be huge. Um, so are there, uh, are there some go-to responses you have uh, that might help with this kind of a discussion? Yes, um, and I want to actually find, there's a wonderful essay by Abeba Berhane reflecting um, oh, on the work of um, Weizenbaum um, that I want to find for you because it, it directly speaks to that. Um, um, but I want to actually find it. Um, sorry, I may have to send it later. Um, Oh, a fair warning, there we go, I've got the link. Okay, this is a fantastic essay and it directly speaks to that point about um, the, uh, if we don't build it, somebody else will. Um, and the, the fallacy there is that um, it, when, when you're thinking in terms of computer science, you think of problems as abstract things that once solved are always solved, right? So someone has built this tech, the tech exists. Someone has built, um, that sub-function or that process or that procedure, it exists and it can be called by anyone. But in fact, when we're thinking about the impact of tech in society, we're thinking about um, existing things being used by particular people, being deployed by particular organizations, right? So if you think about, for example, the, um, the use of face recognition in surveillance um, and what's sort of the, the general feeling in people who are talking about societal impacts of AI is just don't on that. They just really just don't. But if you think about every separate jurisdiction deciding whether or not to deploy it against their citizens, right? That scale matters, right? Is it, you know, happening in 90% of cities in the US or 50% or 30%? That matters. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's not about it exists or it doesn't exist, but how, who's it used by? How many people is it used by? Um, a second thing is, um, I think it's worthwhile for us to think about our research time and effort and contribution as something really valuable. And to, to say in terms of, there's only so much of this that I have to give to the world in a week, in a year, in my lifetime, and I want to put it in places that are the most beneficial. And so even though this is a system that, um, sure, it's not gonna be out in the world because it doesn't work well enough, um, 
But even still, why should I be putting my valuable time into this questionable application when I could be putting it to something more beneficial? Um, so those, those are my answers on that one. Um, what was the other one? Oh, uh, because uh, the system uh, doesn't work too well now, um, it won't be as impactful. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the question there is to say, well, why, why are you working on that question? What's the value there? Um, and if it's because there's a particular algorithm you're interested in testing, why couldn't you have tried it on something else? Like why, why are you working on that one? Okay, yeah. Thanks. Emily, I think a lot of people will need to go soon, but I just wanted to thank you again for coming here. It was a great presentation. I learned a lot. I'm sure everybody else did as well. Thank you all for coming. This, is, this has been really interesting for me. Thank you.